Through some agreements, we want this to be a brave space. We want everybody to show up for yourselves and your community. We know that this place cannot be completely safe, right? This event is public, is put to the public, but we're asking everyone to be brave, um, to be brave and also to be willing to be um, to be in some principal struggle. We may disagree on this call, so we're going to, we don't have to be brave about that. Um, what happens here stays here. What's learned here leaves here. So I'm not going to say, yo, Patrice said this, this, and that. If I ain't asked Patrice if it was okay to say that. But if I did learn something about the jail system in D.C., I will go tell people about that um, from Patrice, right? Want to step up, step back, especially those breakout rooms. If you know you be talking a lot, step back. If you know you don't be talking a lot, step up. Um, it, it, it pretty much goes like that. Um, we also, we want to center the needs of people most directly impacted by the prison industrial complex. And that includes and specifies formerly incarcerated people who, um, and so I want you to know that decisions that we make throughout the call are also informed by that. And if you have any other ones, feel free to drop in the chat. Okay. Good, next one. Awesome. So I'd love for folks to think I might be missing my agenda a little bit, but if folks could introduce yourself in the chat, just give your name um, and your pronouns, where you're calling in from. And if you wanna give like a fun fact, um, just one word about how you're feeling about spring. Um, I know DC, we have a fake spring right now, but it's almost there, y'all. So one word about how you feel about spring. Um, and this is rapid, so just drop in the chat. And yeah, that way we can get to know you. Okay, I see Jamila, I see Emily. Cicadas, really? Okay, Ward 3, you feel hopeful, Sarah, hey, Madeline, uh, hey, LaShonia, Melissa, um, is ready for me. Okay, so folks are a little bit feisty. Um, hey, Amanda, nice to see you. Giddy about spring. I haven't seen the word giddy in a very long time, y'all, so I can see what y'all are already on. Um, Allergies, I feel for you. Can we just like give some like support for the folks who are have allergies right now? Awesome. Okay. So as y'all keep introducing yourself, oh, Free Minds Book Club is here. Make sure y'all see who's in the room. Um, and then let's get into our recap. Oh, I'm on the recap. Okay. So <laughs> racist. So we talked last time we talked about racist history of incarceration in D.C. We talked about who is, what kind of groups of people are currently locked up in D.C. jails and prisons. It was all about divest, invest, take money from one, invest in another. So we talked about two different types of recommendations for cutting MPD's budget. Um, we talked about how we want to move traffic enforcement to the Department of Transportation. And we talked about investing, where that money going to go, right? Two things that came out of that and that you all had a lot of support around was like, we need some money to go into behavioral health crisis response that is not connected to the police and we need money for housing. Um, yeah. We also um, learned a lot of the survey last week and had a couple of questions that popped up that we wanted to make sure we addressed for the full room before we moved on. Um, one question was, what were the mayor and MPD's roles in the task force's recommendations? Um, again, the task force had 26 members. One of those voting members was the deputy mayor for public safety and justice, um, who started out as Kevin Donahue um, and then transitioned to the interim um, at the end of the task force's time. Um, Roger Mitchell, who was also the um, chief medical examiner in DC. Um, so they were a full voting member. And MPD also sent staff as advisors to the decarceration committee, although they did not have a vote in the full task force. So we do have input um, from the administration, um, as well as the council, as well as academics, policy people, advocates, um, 
people who are service providers, practitioners, and, and, and returning citizens and incarcerated people themselves. Um, another question was what was the, re the role of the police reform commission with the task force? Um, so Patrice, who introduced herself earlier, is uh, lucky to be a member of both, um, and she made sure that the task force was informed about what the Police Reform Commission was doing and vice versa. We, the task force didn't get too much into, um, as much into real true policing recommendations, and we'll rely on the Police Reform Commission for their expertise there, um, but we did make some, and we actually, the task force presented their findings to the Police Reform Commission and wrote a letter asking them to endorse the divestment and investment recommendations. So their report will be out um, in April, and we'll see where they land and where we can um, join forces there. Um, Final, the final question we got um, was whether any elected officials have committed to advancing these recommendations yet. Um, the short answer is no, we haven't had an explicit um, commitment, but Councilmember Allen served as a voting member of the task force and really championed um, its work and the recommendations. Um, Count Chairman Mendelson had staff advising the committee on um, facilities and services, um, and Councilmember Lewis George has been very interested um, since she has newly come on the council in making some of these recommendations work. So we know we have a lot of bites, and we briefed the council and their staff a couple of weeks ago, and we're hoping to get um, a more uh, lockdown commitments soon in the future here. Thank you so much for that, Emily. Um, so just want y'all to know, we hear your questions. At the end of this, you're gonna get another exit survey. And so that's where we um, get all the information we need from you. All right, let's go to our agenda. So, oh, sorry, go back one. So we are gonna go through, we're gonna give you um, some, go over our recommendations in a couple ways first. We're gonna present a little background information that you need to know for each category um, of recommendations. And then we're gonna send you into breakout rooms where you're gonna learn about some specific recommendations in that category. So for example, one category is gonna be arrests and charges and ways that we're trying to reduce those things, right? We're gonna give info, gonna to go to a breakout room. In your breakout room, you are, you're gonna have a facilitator, who, one who is an organizer and another one who may also be an organizer, but also worked closely with the task force. And they're gonna teach you recommendations and you all are gonna add some information onto a jam board um, where you will then come back to a large group and tell us what you learned, right? It's just like class, we've done this before. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about how we can make change and we're gonna have some folks talk about their experiences doing that. And we're also gonna hear from, hear about some opportunities for how you can make change around this. And then once again, we gonna have our exit survey and then hopefully y'all get to dinner, okay? Let's go to our next one. What, this, this slide is mine, I think, awesome. So decarceration, what does it mean, right? What's really interesting and important to note here, when people say we like wanna end mass incarceration, let them know that that's not possible without decarcerating. We actually have to let our people free, right? And we actually have to make these different changes to do so. Um, and so the task force recommends reducing the incarcerated population by one third to one half over the next 10 years. Um, there are people who are on our call um, who are in uh, organization and community with us that have uh, diverse recommendations, like cutting it in half. Um, sooner than that, cutting it all together, abolishing prisons. Um, and this is one recommendation for uh, decarceration. I also wanted to make sure you noted um, the task force description of a new uh, tra non-traditional facility. At Working Families Party, we do call this a jail and a prison um, because we believe this is still a part of um, it is a new building, um, but it is still a jail and a prison, and it's important for us to name that difference here. All right. God dang it. It's me again, y'all? Okay. Uh, here we go. So 
I'm going to get into my first section and then thankfully I'm going to be able to pass it to my friends. Um, okay. So group one, if you get moved into group one, you're going to be learning about arrests and charges. I want you to know some really key things. Okay. Also, you'll have these slides afterwards because I know it's a lot of text. There is a difference between being stopped, being arrested and being charged. Here are some of the examples, right? So you have, you might be encountered by the police. It's not a legal stop. Then you're free to walk away, right? If you are in DC, if you're from DC, you may have heard of jump outs, right? Which is like, a, I consider a stop and frisk tactic where officers will really jump out and illegally frisk and search people. Um, it also, it's a scare tactic that a lot of folks on this call are trying to end. You got detainments and stops, which are legal stops where you are not free to walk away. You might have heard of frisk where people say they, uh, they search your outer clothing. Um, MTD sometimes calls that a protective pat down or things. It's a frisk. Um, and then you have arrest, the act of being arrested, right? It is the being taken into custody. And I'm saying regardless of consent, it might be to a police station or some other form. None of that means that you're charged, right? A charge is something a prosecutor claims you're breaking the law, right? There's an assumption. Police don't make charges. And I want you to know that probable cause is relative and vague. So when we go into this, it's important to know that a lot of this stuff is very vague and really based on what a prosecutor wants in this moment or what a police officer wants in this moment. Um, so yeah, those are my things. And I'll pass it to the next person. Okay, y'all. So we're, we're done hearing Kiki talk now. So <laughs> um, again, for those of you who got on late, my name is Kiana and I am the executive director of an organization called Life After Release. This is based in Prince George's County, Maryland. And I'm also an organizer with Harriet's Wildest Dreams, which brings me into DC work. Um, so this pre-trial section is group going to be in group number two, which is going to be very interesting. And I have a, a high interest in this because of the court watching work that I do. Um, but unlike Maryland, um, D.C. eliminated cash bail about 20 years ago in 1992. However, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is that a lot of people are still being detained pre-trial. Um, and this is because uh, the judges and uh, people are using something called a risk assess assessment tool or a RAT, we call it RAT for short, um, um, risk assessment tool, um, which is basically a survey. And this survey is designed um, to assist uh, the folks that are um, in the, like the judges and, and pretrial to release someone back into the community. However, um, historically what we've, what we've noticed and what we have um, um, notice about these rats or these risk assessment tools are that they are um, uh, steeped in racial bias. What, do you, what, do you, what does that mean? That means that uh, if you're black or brown, more than likely you're probably not going to release back into the community because the way that the risk assessment tool is done. Um, DC's pretrial services agency has 43 risk assessment factors in it. However, nobody knows what those risk assessment factors are. Um, they're not publicized anywhere. We just know that there's 43 risk assessment um, factors that they use. And we know that they are um, um, racially charged and biased. Um, and in the US, uh, there's this, what is this? It's 41% of our jails, uh, 41% 41, 41 of the people that are in our jail. So this 738 folks, 41% um, of those are usually not even sentenced once they go through the criminal legal system. So that's a very high number. Uh, and this, this chart here basically shows you exactly what's going on as of 2018 um, in the DC uh, pretrial release and detention section. So that's the part we're gonna be going over. Um, um, yeah, so I'm glad to have you in my group. Thank you, Kiana. Um, so I will be leading the uh, group number three on supervision and revocation of release. And uh, we wanted to take a little bit of time to define our terms for this section too, because we use some unique definitions in DC. Um, so probation. Probation is when you never get sentenced to incarceration, 
Um, and instead the judge says, we're going to keep you in the community. Um, you can do your time on probation, which means you're gonna be supervised. And if you screw up, then um, maybe we will move you to, to prison or to jail as a punishment uh, for not doing well on probation. So it's something that's used for often for people who are, are um, you know, being charged for the first time or have lower level charges. Um, parole and supervised release are actually on the back end. So these are for people who have already spent time in prison and are being released and are continuing to be supervised by the state after they're released from prison. Uh, in DC, um, Parole is a is one form of this supervision, and it's actually something that was ended um, more than 20 years ago. So we have a limited number of people, um, about 660 people in DC, who are still in prison on parolable sentences, um, which means that they, when the judge sentenced them, they were given an indeterminate sentence, something like um, 20 to 30 years or something like 25 to life. And the bottom number is when they become parolable. And the top number, it could be 30 years or it could be life, um, is when they have to be let out of prison. And any time in between there, they can go in front of a parole board and ask to be released. Once they're released to the community, same thing as probation, um, you can still be sent back to prison for breaking the rules of your supervision. DC doesn't use that sentencing scheme anymore. It's called indeterminate sentencing. Um, we use determinate sentencing now, which is what it sounds like. It's more certain. Um, so instead of having this range where then you have to ask to be released, um, in DC now you get a sentence for incarceration and you get a sentence for supervision. So um, you might be sentenced to um, seven years in prison and to three years of supervision. And, and so you know um, with more certainty when you're getting out and when you'll be in the community. Those community years though can still be revoked and you can be sent back to prison for breaking the rules. Um, this accounts for a huge portion of the people who were justice involved in DC. Uh, about 9,500 people a day are under supervision for either probation, parole, or supervised release. Um, about 16% of the people who are locked up in DC's jail are there because they are alleged to have violated the terms of their release and they are um, being held either as punishment for that or awaiting a hearing on those allegations. Um, and about 10% of DC's prison population is, has been sent back to prison because they have um, been found to have violated the um, conditions of their release. Um, this is, so we have a lot of recommendations about how to change this so that less people are on supervision for shorter amounts of time and are less likely to be revoked. Um, and we'll, that's what we'll be talking about in this breakout group. And so the final breakout group gets to be with Tyrone and I, and we are going to talk about reducing time um, for folks who are incarcerated. Um, so people who are sentenced to incarceration for a DC code offense for more than a year are sent to Federal Bureau of Prison Facilities or BOP facilities. Um, those facilities can be hundreds to thousands of miles away, um, taking people away from their families, friends, communities, um, reducing the amount of time that people are incarcerated means reconsidering sentencing and release. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what exactly that means. So sentencing is when a judge orders a punishment, such as a term of imprisonment after finding someone guilty. Um, with sentencing, sometimes you might hear folks talk about mandatory minimums. Mandatory minimums um, are terms that judges must impose based on the type of offense and circumstances. And then you might also hear about enhancements when talking about sentencing. Um, and enhancements are specific circumstances of an offense, like the presence of a weapon. Um, and that will generally increase the sentence. And sometimes it increases the sentence by a lot. Um, we put people away for a really long time. And I'll give you a few examples. Um, six years on average for a violation of parole or supervised release, eight years on drug charges, 15 years for burglary, burglary and larceny, um, and 13 years, um, 13 years for larceny, 
and then more than 27 years on average for homicide. So these are these are big chunks of time and these are big parts of, of a person's life. Um, our group will also, on top of talking about sentencing, will also talk about good time policy and work release and ways that terms of imprisonment can be modified. Thank you so much, Casey. Let me. All right, y'all. Can you... All right, there we go. So, y'all, you're about to be in your breakout sessions. The point of your breakout session, we want you to learn about these key recommendations, process as a group, and share what's coming up for you. You're going to use what we call a Jamboard. Um, so, let's drop the link to the Jamboard now um, so people have it. Um, and your facilitator will have the link to the Jamboard. This is where you're going to describe and show what came up for you, how you're feeling about these recommendations. And when we come back after 25 minutes, you're going to share with the group what these recommendations are and what came up for you. Um, all right, so please feel free to drop in the chat how that, how you were feeling, how that was. Um, I know that it was short. Um, each week we try and want to give more time to breakout room breakout time, and we're still going to have space right now. So group one, two, three, and four, if you didn't get a chance to, um, you should have someone volunteer to present for your group. I'm going to give you two minutes just to tell us, you know, what did you, what did you learn in your group? Um, and then afterwards, we're all going to come have a discussion, and we're going to use Stack. So that means you let us know if you want to talk in the discussion, in the chat and then we'll unmute you in a list, okay? So uh, let's go to group four. We'll, we'll mix it up, because I was in group one, so. Um, just drop in the chat who you'd like us to unmute. Hi all, can you hear me? Awesome, just one second. Yeah, oh, my name is Renal. I use he and pronouns. And uh, I was one of the members in the fourth breakout room. So if if you are, if you are still looking at the Jamboard, you can go to the fourth, fourth one. So uh, people in our breakout room talked about how they were excited about the uh, second look commitment act, um, expansion recommendation and how everyone deserves a second chance. And um, they, they felt good about this um, recommendation. And uh, they talked about- One second. Yeah, sure. Rinal, you're on, what group are you on? On number four. Number four, okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, number four. Um, and then we were talking about how, um, so the second one, the second yellow one, which talks about how, in, it would make a more incarcerated people eligible for work release, including release to halfway house or home confinement. We said that it's it's a good step forward, but it's not a solution because um, this still uh, you know prevents people from doing things like uh, going to community and they're also being constantly monitored. And we also talked about how sometimes technology fails, and that can that can't always be a good. Um, way to see what's going on. And then, um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the Jamboard. Um, yeah, we kind of talked about uh, a possible better solution to home confinement that's been recommended here would be to allow a person to be home without being monitored. Like you, ho you hold them accountable, you trust them, you, you, you trust them to report back to you, you know, instead of us constantly monitoring them using technology. And, um, Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, to add on to that, we said it would be, uh, be good if people on home confinement can go to community spaces like libraries, community centers, and have volunteer opportunities. And, and, mm -hmm. and we also want to emphasize that uh, we actually asked the question if it's possible for people to be at home and also be at community in the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Yeah, I think uh, I feel like I captured everything here. It's something. Thank you so much, Renal. Y'all, uh, if you're on camera, give some support uh, or show some, show Renal some love. Uh, thank you for presenting for your group. Uh, let's go to group three. Awesome. Now let me let us know or any of the hosts know. If you're a facilitator, uh, press uh, ask to unmute to your person who's uh, presenting for you. Larry is going to present for us. Is Larry here? Larry is here. Um, I just pressed ask to unmute. Okay. Next group, oh. get prepared to ask your person. All right. Okay, there you go. It's, it's unmuted now. Uh, so yes, yeah, so our uh, group, group three, uh, recommendation, the recommendations we discussed included uh, prohibit revocations for first technical violation with exceptions. Uh, prohibit revocations based on new charges without guilty disposition and reduce max probation to one year for misdemeanor, two years for felony, reduce max revised release for two years. Uh, some of the uh, discussion points that came up uh, during our conversation include uh, what does positive behavior support and accountability look like if you aren't revoking people's supervision? Um, also, it's so important to keep supervision short. Why can't these support service? Why can't these support services be done uh, without the threat of punishment? Also, it's so important not to revoke based on new arrests, but to require conviction instead. Um, and uh, we also expressed concern about uh, stay away order exception. Will this actually help, and what is it tied to? Uh, and then we kind of open the, the conversation just talking about language. Does language matter? Returning citizens, for example, is a term of self-identification uh, self usually used by those recently released from jail. Um, we also kind of closed our conversation. Uh, well, uh, I added like how uh, or if any and all of these uh, recommendations and just the, the state of uh, 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 the jails uh, and, the, and the, the, the act of incarceration, the entire system, how it changes if and when statehood happens, um, which could uh, have us reshuffling a duck as well. Um, and hopefully there's a few seconds uh, left where, um, Emily, you want to add anything? That's great. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Group two. We still need a volunteer. All right, group two. Uh, anyone want to volunteer as tribute? Move us along. Y'all got some good stuff on here. Anna, thank you. That'd be great, Anna. Thank you. Awesome. So you should unmute Anna. There we go. Sorry. I think it took a little time on my computer for some reason. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll try to do my best here. We had varying degrees of uh, familiarity with the issue within the group, but we had a very robust discussion. And I think a lot of the underlying um, points that we came up with, and we were talking about pretrial and various aspects of it. And there was a consensus that there, whatever changes we make need to be in a way that they are humanizing for both sides, for the victim and for the person who is being in, held or potentially being placed in a pretrial detention. So 
among our recommendations, there was uh, making sure that um, if the attorney or whenever the attorney is assigned to appear for the person uh, to discuss any possible misdemeanor violations or whatever, that he doesn't sign off sign off or sign any kind of waivers on behalf of the client. If the person wants to appear or doesn't appear, it's up to the person. Then there were things like consulting the victim is with regard to a pretrial release hearing. And we were talking about different aspects of that where there are so many nuances. Obviously, it's we had a very short period of time to talk about all of this, but we were that's where we were talking. There are so many possible nuances. It needs to be a tailored approach uh, as much as possible. There is no one size fits all here and all the different aspects of people's lives need to be considered if it would be very different for a case where a victim wants to remain quiet, confidential, hidden for her, her, for her or his safety versus a case where the victim may not be um, uh, interested in holding the person in pretrial at all. So in other words, there needs to be a lot of a facilitation of a dialogue with consideration of safety and all the different aspects of lives of people involved. And there was also a recommendation that um, there needs to be well, we didn't we didn't get a chance to discuss this one much, but there was the recommendation to repeal the rebuttable presumption of pretrial incarceration for certain people instead and instead require individual determination in all cases. So there was, I think, a unanimous agreement on that. We just we all, I think, felt like we were needing a bit more time to talk about it. But um, let's see patrice i'm having trouble hearing seeing here on screen actually some of the small font uh what did i miss um i think that was really good thank y'all thank you so much y'all show some support uh to group, both group two and group three and last but not least we have madeline for group one hey everybody uh, so we talked about four recommendations, but two that really stood out to us as potentially transformative were um, raising the juvenile court jurisdiction to 21. We talked about how um, wild it is that some teenagers, 16 year olds and younger are tried as adults and the impact that must have on their lives and the lives of their families. Um, and the other one that really stood out to us was moving traffic enforcement to DDOT, that traffic enforcement is such like a frequent and common way that people interact with the police. And that could be really huge for DC to change. Um, we also were curious about what percent or proportion of the stops and arrests are in wards five, seven, and eight. Um, we think we have that data, but didn't have access to it tonight. So we're curious about um, checking into that. Um, and something else we were thinking about, especially as it pertains to the potential of a hotline for the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, would be making sure none of these recommendations actually add money to costs in the prison industrial complex that we're not, we're, we're working to defund the police, so we want to make sure that those recommendations don't sneakily add money, as the state loves to do. Um, we also talked about what things we'd like to see decriminalized since one of the recommendations is a review of the criminal code and just how transformative that could be to decriminalize things like um, sex work, drug use, and daily living activities. Um, decriminalizing the experience of homelessness uh, would be really huge. Um, and uh, like many groups, we talked about what power we have, what local control looks like, and whether we can really make these changes and how we advocate for them. Thanks so much, Madeline. Y'all give some support. Also, I see Ben from our group is hopping off. Um, folks, if you have to leave early, that's totally fine. Make sure to follow up um, with that exit survey. Um, we have a little bit more um, to share before you let me go before we let you go at 730. Um, so because of time, we are going to skip um, our high key alerts.
And so we're going to go about three, two slides into the future of FEMI, but everyone is going to get the PDF of the slides. So uh, no worries about that. All right, let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we make change. Last week, a lot of people were like, I'm down. I'm ready to do this. What next? Um, so we want to talk a little bit about budget advocacy, um, le legislative advocacy, like changing the laws. We're going to talk about opportunity for skill building. And, of course, getting organized with WFP. All of this is so that we can build a better, bigger we and make structural change. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. So really quickly, um, you're gonna get this slide. My main piece here is to note that we have a budget season. A lot of the things that you talked about today had to do with money. And we know that there is, the mayor puts out a proposed budget. That money goes to certain committees and those committees have jurisdiction over that money. And then we get a bunch of time where council members get to move money around. Because of the landscape in DC right now, we usually target the council and where they're moving money around. Um, and right now we know that the, these, they're gonna be hearings, budget hearings, where we can write to them and let them know what we wanna change. So if we want you to raise your voice, you can submit in writing or you share in person. Um, if you stay with uh, WFP, we'll be sending out updates of when these hearings are. Um, but right now, here's some of the ones that you can expect. Behavioral Health, Department of Corrections, Transportation, Housing Authority, and MPD. Nikia, so sorry okay. to interrupt, but they changed some of the hearing dates today. So I just wanted to flag for you the dates changed because the budget got moved back a month. Those are today's dates. We just updated Those them. are today's dates. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yep. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no for anyone who has seen yeah, an no. earlier version, they just sent out a new schedule today. And they probably will again. <laughs> yeah. We can, I'll drop the link in the chat um, for where the new schedules get posted so that if you want to keep an eye on that, you can. Thank you. All right, let's pass it to Ty. Okay, how y'all doing this evening? My name is Tavron Hall and I'm from the Wool One Shaw Howard community. And I've been a proud member of the District Task Force Bull uh, about two years now. The first time I look at it, I call it signifying instead of testifying because it always been associated with me as, as something bad, like dealing with court and trial. I think a lot more people who share their experiences will feel more comfortable doing it if we like call it signifying. So I started like a, a, a trend saying signifying. At first, I was just like nervous about public speaking because I always been somewhat of an introvert. I always like like bear by myself. I feel like I could think more. So opening up in front of people just like took me a long time to overcome. But I'm also religious. And Matthew 10, 19, 20 says, do not worry about what to do or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. I believe once I started praying and giving my time to God, confidence started to speak out of me. Once I'm able to like speak on issues that really bother me, I noticed over time I got better and better at speaking. So I feel like uh, 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 speaking at budget hearings about what's really going on is is is, is a key is a, is a key component to uh, stopping what's going on. You know what I'm saying? Because let's be honest, the same thing will continue to happen. It's just going to be a different name. Um, the more questions I was asked during this information, I asked for help learning beforehand. The more I prepared, I felt the more comfortable I got. So once again, my name is Tavron Hall. You know what I'm saying? And I'm gonna be honest with y'all, straight, straight up. Like since I joined the district tax board board in 2019, my life has has took a surplus of of, of better because I have removed the negative people from my life and start focusing on people that really wanted to help me. You know what I'm saying? Since then, I like have my education. I done just graduated from prisons to professionals, PhD. Um, 
it's just like so much that's going on, you know what I'm saying? And it started with me speaking at this budget hearing. So if you, I feel like if you want to, you know, um, better your life, better your situation, better those around you, you know what I'm saying? Then it starts here, you know what I'm saying? Thank you. Thank you, Ty, y'all. Can y'all show some love to Ty in the chat? Okay. All right, I'm gonna pass it to Larry. All right, Larry, I might need to, if I can get some help in unmuting Larry um, from my co-facilitating team. I think I'm unmuted. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna quickly talk about, uh, uh, since we're on the, conversation of storytelling and testifying. Um, uh, I run, uh, with the ACLU DC, run a uh, storytelling workshop for advocacy uh, monthly. Um, we talk about uh, changing policy, setting policy, um, and many of us as residents, not, I mean, obviously us on, on this call, many of us on these calls throughout the day in our jobs, uh, we're around council, we're around hearings, we understand the kind of schedule and just the, the climate in which we, we are speaking and all the issues. But residents, any resident, anyone who lives in a district can uh, testify. It's simple because every resident in this city, no matter what neighborhood, how old you are, your background, et cetera, has your own lived experience. And when city leaders are crafting new policy and new legislation, it is your lived experience that should uh, should inform those decisions. And most days during the calendar year, of course, we can meet with them directly in their offices. Uh, but this time of year, obviously during budget and oversight uh, season, we can do, uh, we can meet virtually uh, through Zoom and we can meet with, the, with them directly one-on-one um, -on -one in, in some uh, Zoom meetings as well. Um, and often, and when we share our story with, uh, with whether it's elected leaders, community members in our neighborhoods, at our ANC meetings, PTA meetings, um, or in our congregations, we teach each other about the problems or issues that they may not be aware of or build community co coalitions with others who share the same passion about a topic, but sometimes don't know. So whether we're talking about community safety, alternatives to police and schools, or statehood for district, well, for DC, our perspective as, as city residents matter. And those shared perspectives can make a difference on how our city is run. Uh, and this workshop helps to kind of identify the key elements you want to include when sharing your story or testimony, uh, your personal story within your testimony to an elected leader. Uh, what, what are the elements you wanna to remember to, to include? What are elements you wanna kind of stay away from? Thinking about the time limit, you know, and all that you do to provide, uh, uh, to include in your script. Um, if you want to learn more uh, or join uh, this uh, workshop, again, it's happening every month. This one uh, in March is happening this Saturday, March 20th from 12 to 1.30. Um, if uh, you'd like to learn more, um, I can put my contact info in the chat as well. Thank you for the opportunity for sharing. Thank you so much, Larry. I've actually dropped the link in the chat. So people go ahead and sign up for this training. Um, it is on Saturday at 12 o'clock. Um, I heard wonderful things about it. All right, let's go to our next slide. Next slide, next slide. There we go. All right, y'all, so if I, this is me. Activism and having a political home. Working Families Party is not a political part, is not a political party in DC officially, but we try and fit in where the dominant parties don't be taking care of our folks, and that is provide some political home. Um, if you want to get down with WFP, you can sign up to volunteer and you can sign up for our Repair Historic Harms Working Group. Um, and that's a working group that's going to be working on all the things that we talked about today. Um, defund the MPD, D Department of Corrections, all of that good stuff. You can go to bit.ly, DC, WFP volunteer, all lowercase. I'm also going to, because it is case sensitive, also going to drop it in the chat. Um, so feel free to sign up uh, to, to 
so we can have more conversations. We can dive deeper in this and figure out what we want. I also would be remiss to let you know next year is a whole bunch of elections and there is a attorney general election. And before we make any endorsements, we got to know what's going on. So feel free to signify, hashtag signify. Thank you, Ty. Uh, so come adv uh, advocate with us, um, signify with us and all.